There we go. Okay. okay. Perfect. All right, guys. Well, welcome. I'm Corey Barat. I am a colorectal surgeon in Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm the Osler uh, course director for colorectal. Um, some familiar faces from previous Osler courses. Um, I also obviously do the oral um, colorectal mock orals as well. So before I forget, I'll put a plug in for that. After you guys pass the written boards with flying colors, please uh, come back and visit us for our, uh, it's just a one day, uh, a one day course for the colorectal the day before. Uh, it's great, it's a great little course that we put together. Um, all right. Oh, well, I should also say welcome not only to our analog viewers here, but also to our digital viewers as well. So thanks for everyone that's uh, tuning in. So the first uh, topic we're gonna talk about is some of your basics, your anatomy, physiology, and uh, benign anorectal part one. So again, about this course. So the purpose is to help highlight the areas of deficiencies for further review before the test, help solidify concepts you've already learned, and obviously to review. Uh, this is not meant to replace reading a textbook. I wish we could give you everything you needed in a uh, one day uh, course here, but uh, as you guys know, um, it's not a replacement uh, for reading a textbook and reviewing a textbook, and it's not a replacement for your own clinical judgment and your own experience, um, and it's not meant to be the only right answer in any given situation. Um, all right, so let me talk a little bit about the test itself. Um, I felt like it was essentially an absite or a gen surge test on steroids um, with a higher level of understanding, especially with more colorectal specific topics. And I put that in quotes because we obviously expect all of our general surgery colleagues as well to know about treating things that they deal with a lot as well, colon cancer. Um, but the colorectal test um, has a lot more uh, pelvic floor, constipation, a lot more detail as far as rectal cancer, miscellaneous tumors. There's interpretations of some slides, some pictures, some radiology. Uh, fortunately, uh, not, not too many, um, but, um, but uh, de definitely enough that it's worth reviewing um, some common, uh, common slides. There's more than, very likely to be more than one correct answer. Um, so make sure you're reading the questions carefully and reading all the answers, and sometimes it's a decision of choosing the most correct. Um, uh, also different from the general surgery, I found that there was a lot of fairly recent topics, uh, transanal TME, the latest NCCN guidelines, I mean, even things that are in current in the literature in the last six to 12 months. Um, uh, so, but uh, that being said, a certain percentage of the questions are testing the test. As far as experimental, of course, we don't know how many, what percentage, um, or how they determine the grades. But, um, but yeah, you guys know, you guys know how to do this. You've been doing standardized tests every year, or your whole life, so nothing really too special about this, and obviously use all of your common sense test taking uh, skills. So the format of, the, of today, each session is gonna be about 45 minutes with uh, multiple more or less related topics and a few review questions throughout the slides. Um, by the end of today, we will uh, aim to cover a very large breadth of colorectal. Um, depending on our timing here, we may need to go straight through to the next session. Um, if we have some time and I f uh, feel like we're at a good pace, feel free to ask questions, but uh, probably the best thing is to save it till the end so that we make sure we get through all the slides. Um, and we really wanna know your honest feedback. Um, those of you in person and at home, please respond to surveys. That's, that's how we get better. So, um, and we wanna continually make this course better for you and for your future colleagues. And I personally have a lot of stake in this as uh, a colorectal surgeon. We all know this is a small community um, we're, we'll see each other at conferences and run into each other. Um, so I really want to make this a great course. Okay, so we're going to hit some of the key concepts first and then dive into some of the details. Colon histology, physiology. So the colonic innervation is by both the in extrinsic and the intrinsic pathways. Um, the parasympathetic are the excitatory and the sympathetic are the inhibitory. Uh, don't forget your myenteric plexus as the intrinsic uh, innervation. SCFA, short chain fatty acids, are produced by the colon as a result of fermentation of carbohydrates by the bacterial flora. And butyrate is the one to remember is the primary energy source of uh, epithelium. 
Um, the colon absorbs sodium, which is mediated by aldosterone, as well as water, and secretes bicarb and potassium. Uh, there are two types of contractions, segmental and propagated. We have the high amplitude propagating contractions uh, that helps pro propel contents distally. And don't forget your interstitial cells of Cajal are the primary pacemaker cells uh, that govern the enteric nervous system. So here is a slide uh, of a normal uh, colon wall. Um, you guys, this is fairly basic stuff, but you may see something like this on your test. Um, we have your mucosa, your submucosa, your muscularis, and your serosa, and the muscularis layers divided into uh, the circular and longitudinal layers. So the three main epithelial cell types are the columnar epithelium, the goblet cells, and the EC, or the enterochromaffin cells. The columnar and the goblet make up 95% of, of the epithelium. Um, the uh, crypt epithelium are highly prolifer proliferative and secrete chloride, whereas the surface epithelium uh, has low prol proliferation. It's well differentiated and is highly absorptive. Um, we'll talk a little about the cells of the enteric nervous system and submucosa, also known as Meisner's plexus. Uh, there's also Auerbach's plexus, additional layer between the inner circular and outer longitudinal muscles, um, as well as the inter interstitial cells of Cajal. And we keep mentioning these because there is some clinical uh, uh, correlation as the pacemaker cells. These are C-kit positive on path slides. Uh, it's one of those key, key things to remember. Um, and they link the colonic submucosa electrochemically with the myenteric plexus. All right, ready for a question. Other than the physiologic function of the interstitial cells of Cajal as the pacemaker cells of the colon, why are they clinically significant? So we have A, underlying explanation for slow transit constipation, B, precursor cell for squamous cancers of the anus, C, precursor cells for GIST, GIST tumors, D, because Cajal was a Nobel laureate, E, precursor cell for adenocarcinoma. What do you guys think? C, C, I've heard C. Uh, so C is the correct answer. But as I mentioned, there are other less, st still true, but not necessarily best answer. So Cajal was a Nobel laureate. I don't know if uh, I sort of found that to be interesting trivia. But again, this is not the best answer for the question, even though it is actually true and it is half true as far as uh, slow transit constipation. So pretty typical type of uh, question that you guys will see on the, uh, on the exam. Okay, so let's talk about the colonic flora. The stool contains 10 to the 11 uh, to 10 to the 12 bacteria per gram. That's a crazy high number. Over 400 species, it contributes to actually 50% of the fecal mass by weight. Uh, majority of these are anaerobes, uh, and they feed on the residual proteins and undigested carbohydrates. Um, they contribute to the uh, GALT, the innate and adaptive immunity. Um, so bacteroides are the predominant species. They are two-thirds of all the bacteria of the colon. Um, also some of these miscellaneous gram-negative um, aerobes, such as E. coli, Klebsiella, Proteus, Lactobacillus, Enterococci, and again, Nutrition comes from the short chain fatty acids via fermentation from these anaerobes. So nutrition to the mucosa comes from these anaerobes. Um, here's a slide of a normal appendix. Again, you can see the four layers of the bowel wall um, with a lot more uh, lymphatic um, uh, lymphocytes and immune type of cells. All right, so talk a little bit more about anatomy. So the dentate line is probably the most important thing that we talk about on our daily, in our daily practice. The dentate line is the true division between the embryonic endoderm and ectoderm. Um, another key concept is the anterior parental reflection, um, which can be variable um, and can be altered, but we'll talk, you guys are hear more, much more about that when you talk about rectal cancer. As you guys know, it's a very important landmark. Um, the right and left ischial anal space communicate posteriorly to the deep postanal space, um, right? So this is the uh, horseshoe, uh, official and horseshoe abscess, right? So that's why this is clinically important. Um, another clinically important uh, fact of the anatomy is the junction of the midgut and the hindgut, which leads to a watershed area of the splenic flexure. Uh, and don't forget your three-stage process of GI rotation during development. Um, 
a yeah, fairly busy slide, but um, this uh, probably the most important part is um, the anal rectal anatomy below and seeing the relationship of the dentate line and the levators, um, all that. Okay. All right, so we should uh, define the anatomic anal canal versus the surgical anal canal. Anatomic is, again, the dentate line to the anal verge. Uh, this is also known as anoderm. The surgical anal canal is the anal rectal ring. This is a little bit harder to, to define, uh, and it's interesting when you read um, colonoscopy reports from, from GI physicians and, and you know uh, other people that are describing the anal rectal ring. It's actually a little bit uh, uh, tougher to find clinically. You can see it on an MRI, obviously, uh, but it's where the external sphincter turns into the puborectalis. Um, here's your average length, 4.4 uh, centimeters in males, 4 in females. Um, we have the internal anal sphincter, which is a continuous, continuous with the circular muscle of the rectum, and the external anal sphincter, which uh, extends past the internal. There's three parts. Uh, again, we sort of define these in textbooks, but in reality, uh, difficult to distinguish uh, exactly where one starts and where, en where one ends, but the subcutaneous is superficial and the deep. And then we have the intersphincteric groove as a very important landmark. Who wants to tell us why? Why is intersphincteric groove? Give me one example of, when, of why we use this as a uh, important landmark in our in clinical practice. You guys both said it at the same time. That's great. So lateral internal sphincterotomy, right, that is a key landmark. It's also a key landmark in fistula surgery. Uh, it's a key landmark in doing an intersphincteric dissection, intersphincteric proctectomy. It's a, really a key landmark for any uh, uh, endorectal uh, and colon and rectal operation. All right, so here's a uh, picture of the uh, anam anatomy of the pelvic floor. Um, again, some basic review here. Um, so the levator ani unit is composed of the pubococcygeus, also known as the pubovisceral uh, muscle, the puborectalis and the iliococcygeus, innervated by the pudendal nerve branches, the perineal nerve and the inferior rectal nerve, as well as direct sacral nerves S3 and sometimes S4. Uh, the puborectalis is probably the one to remember, the most important one for continence. So these fibers arise from the lower part of the pubis and the superior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm running alongside the anorectal junction. There it is again. Um, it goes posterior, travels posterior to the rectum to form a sling. All right, so the most important point is at the end here. So the contraction of the puborectalis as a sling causes a horizontal force that closes the pelvic diaphragm and decreases the anorectal angle during squeeze, okay? Uh, another histology slide. Like I said, I think it's, it's worth it to be familiar with a couple of the normal slides um, and a couple of the very common uh, abnormal slides. You might see something like this on your test. Um, and being able to di differentiate columnar epithelium to the right of the screen and squamous epithelium is uh, worthwhile. All right, some anatomy of the rectum itself. There, it is a variable length organ. Um, some define it 0 to 7 as the lower mid 7 to 12, upper 12 to 15. Some define 0 to 5, 6 to 10 to 11 to 15. Um, the majority of the rectum is extra peritoneal. Um, the anterior, anterior and lateral upper rectum is covered by, by a visceral peritoneum all the way to the anterior parent reflection, which is about 9 to 10 centimeters from the anal verge. Again, that anterior parent reflection will keep coming up over and over again as a key anatomic landmark. Um, again, a nice netter drawing here uh, of the rectum and the issue rectal spaces, which will be important for um, uh, anal rectal abscesses and fistula anatomy. Um, okay, so let's talk about some other important fascias. So the presacral fascia is a thickened endopelvic fascia overlying the sacrum. It covers the presacral veins, hypogastric nerves, contributes laterally to the lateral ligaments of the rectum and can't, covers the anococcygeal ligament. The retrosac uh, retrosacral fascia, also known as Waldeyer's fascia, uh, originates in the third and fourth portion of the sacrum, extends anteriorly uh, to the posterior fascia propria, three to four centimeters proximal to the anal rectal junction. This has to be, and then, uh, it's, in, it's interesting to know these exact uh, uh, definitions of the anatomically, but clinically, this is something that you will, you will see and must be sharply divided 
while you're doing your posterior total mesorectal dissection. Okay. Uh, Don Vellier's fascia. Um, this arises from the fusion of uh, two walls of embryologic uh, peritoneal cul-de-sac and extends from the deepest point of the retro retrovesicles pouch to the pelvic floor. And again, what's important about this, right? So again, these two layers are sometimes fairly indistinct when you're doing this anterior dissection of the mid and lower rectum. Um, if you have a tumor in this area, this is a fascia that you want to stay closer to the prostatic side. Um, it also contains a lot of the periprosthetic nerves, which can affect sexual function. Okay, speaking of nerves, we'll talk about a couple important nerves. Okay. So the innervation of the anorectum, the sympathetic uh, nerves arise from L1, L2, L3, pass through the sympathetic chains and join the preaortic plexus. They run adjacent to the uh, inferior mesenteric artery, IMA. The hypogastric nerves, also important to, to know, contain sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers from S2, S3, S4. Uh, again, this periprosthetic plexus is coming back as a subdivision of the pelvic